When we last left James Bond, we were about to meet some of the women in his life. Who are you? My name is Pussy Galore. I must be dreaming. Welcome back to listener-supported KPBS Cinema Junkie. I'm Accomando, Beth Accomando. Earlier this month, the latest film in the 007 franchise, No Time to Die, finally hit theaters after a year and a half pandemic delay. That film gave us some radically different female characters than we've seen cross Bond's path in previous decades. That's where we left off our discussion in part one of Cinema Junkie's Bond, James Bond. Now we're going to pick up our discussion of the literary and cinematic world of James Bond in part two of Cinema Junkie's exploration of fantasy spies. So join us as we pick our favorite Bond babes, as well as favorite Bond actors in films. You might be surprised by the choices. To explore more of the 007 universe, I'm bringing back my favorite special agents, Gary Dexter and Jeff Quest. They're a pair of espionage aficionados, as well as regular contributors to Shane Whaley's Spyberry podcast. Last month, Gary Dexter flew to London to see No Time to Die twice at its earliest release date, and Jeff Quest describes himself as a huge fan of spy novels and runs spyright.com, a website dedicated to spy fiction and nonfiction. I'll be back with Gary and Jeff to continue our discussion of the Bond franchise. But first, I need to take one quick break. And to take us into that break, here's Sterling Anno with a Share Your Addiction. Sterling Anno here from the Oceanside, Horrible Imaginings, and San Diego Underground Film Festivals. And one addiction I want to share with you today is Charles Lawton's Night of the Hunter. I can't get enough of this film. My family can't get enough of this film. And I think that's a great problem to have, honestly. It is the one film I can identify with having bridged all members of my family together on one, at least one agreement, that it's a fantastic piece of cinema, regardless of our political beliefs, of our differences, and any sort. I believe true cinema does that to people, and this is the one title I can claim as the one to do that with us, and hopefully you all have your own as well. It's a great thing to have if you can find it. It can be tough, but not a day goes by, I'm not grateful for mine. And that's uh, all I got to say. Thanks, Sterling. Sit tight and don't push any red buttons, and I'll be right back with more 007 fun. KPBS On Demand is supported by Illumina, a global leader in DNA sequencing, helping clinicians and researchers all over the world understand the genetics of disease to make personalized medicine a reality. From genetic testing to developing new vaccines to help protect people around the globe, Illumina DNA sequencing is impacting the future of healthcare. Discover more about the power of the genome by visiting illumina.com slash kpbs. Welcome back. In part one of our discussion of Bond, James Bond, we left off discussing the formulaic elements that we expect in a 007 movie. One of the things we've come to expect are Bond girls. Now, the franchise has received considerable criticism for its depiction of women, often being called sexist, chauvinistic, and even downright misogynistic. From our current perspective, many of the early Bond films do have cringeworthy moments, like this from Goldfinger. I thought I'd find you in good hands. Felix! Felix, how are you? Dink, meet Felix Leiter. Hello. Felix, say hello to Dink. Hi, Dink. Dink, say goodbye to Felix. Hmm? Uh, man talk. Oh, and just for emphasis, Dink gets a slap on the butt from Bond. While such behavior would not be tolerated in a film today, this was 1964, and Bond was never meant to be a role model presented for people to imitate. So to ask those early films from more than a half a century ago to reflect today's attitudes is a bit unfair. And let me put this into a context from the perspective of a four-year-old girl in 1964. Mary Poppins and My Fair Lady were the top box office draws that year. Doris Day was being pushed on me as a modern woman role model. And the Beverly Hillbillies and Petticoat Junction were the top-rated TV shows. That's a pretty bleak landscape for images of women. 
So yeah, I'm much more comfortable with Pussy Galore and Diana Riggs Tracy DiVincenzo as my 60s era role models than Doris Day. So now let's hear from Jeff and Gary on the legacy of the Bond girls. To lead us into Jeff's comments, here's Ursula Andress emerging from Jamaican waters to reveal the very first cinematic Bond girl in 1962's Dr. No. Looking for shells? No, I'm just looking. Stay where you are. I promise I won't steal your shells. I promise you you won't either. What's your name? Ryder. Ryder what? Honey Ryder. I think we've seen Bond over the years struggle, right? Because I think it, it was very black and white back in the 60s, the way they could play these characters, I think, a little bit more. And as times have shifted, I think there's been tension and how to how to have bond interact with some of the the female characters that they bring in especially more recently and i think it's hard because it they want to play with that formula they want to keep that formula in place but it's less and less palatable to have a kind of sean connery era style in in modern times and i agree with that you know i think there's been some you know you had michelle yao as as one of the the bond female characters would you pause this soap over there you were pretty good with that hook it comes from growing up in a rough neighborhood uh-huh. You were pretty good on the bike. Well, that comes from not growing up at all. <laughs> Here, allow me. Don't get any ideas, Mr. Bond. Just off the cuff, I thought we might link up. Work hand in hand? Stick closer to each other. Yeah. Maybe we go after General Chang together. Your turn. Thanks for washing my hair. I work alone. The Bond female characters, uh, Halle Berry, I think they were different in, in the way that they were trying to portray them with uh, Brosnan. Are you going to get me off this thing? What are you, CIA? NSA. Hello? We're on the same side. Doesn't mean we're after the same thing. Jura does. World peace, unconditional love, and your little friend with the expensive acne. More recently, you know, you see with Daniel Craig, they've done some different things, especially in Casino Royale, where they're trying to make this a darker character and give some more nuance to some of the people that they're bringing in, some of the female leads. By the cut of your suit, you went to Oxford or wherever. Naturally think human beings dressed like that. But you were it with such disdain. My guess is you didn't come from money, and your school friends never let you forget it. Which means you were at that school by the grace of someone else's charity, hence the chip on your shoulder. And since your first thought about me ran to orphan, that's what I'd say you are. Well, you are. <laughs> I like the spooky thing. And that makes perfect sense. Since MI6 looks for maladjusted young men, I give little thought to sacrificing others in order to protect queen and country. So I think it's a, a delicate dance that they've been walking, and I don't know if they've been successful all the time, but I... I appreciate their struggle with it i guess well of course the thing that we've seen go away mercifully is the uh, is the casual violence against the female characters james you are hurting i'll do worse than that if you don't tell me you're doing this under orders i know what are they i don't know what you mean liar <laughs> it's fairly commonplace in uh, in the connery era and, and even the very early roger era although i know that from interviews with Moore himself. He found that very distasteful. I think we've had a few decades where it would be the cliche for the actresses that had been given the roles, have won the roles, to say, well, I'm going to be a different kind of uh, Bond girl, as they used to be known. And then we'd get to the movie and find that, well, no, unfortunately, they weren't that different. I do think that a lot of the villainess, if you like, roles, or the female henchmen I'm thinking of, Zinni on the top in particular. You don't need the gun, Commander. That depends on your definition of safe sex. It's close enough. Not for what I have in mind. Particularly strong characters, and and you know even Pussy Galore, very ambiguous, semi villainess. Well, won't you join me? Not on duty. I'm Mr. Goldfinger's personal pilot. You are. And uh, just how personal is that? I'm a damn good pilot. 
period. Well, that's good news. This should be a memorable flight. You can turn off the charm. I'm immune. They've been stronger and actually more of Bond's equals. And I think we're moving to a time now, and we'll see how they do with No Time to Die, where we're finally actually going to see women on a par with Bond. We've got a woman of colour carrying the 007 role, and from what we've seen in the trailers, that's going to be um, a genuine equal. In trouble? Constantly. Nomi is probably one of the only few women, and also women of colour, in MI6 and in the Double O programme. The women that you see in this movie will very clearly reflect the kind of women that are in the world today and being badasses at that. I think that's the way it should be going forward. I mean, we don't want Bond to be overly realistic, but we need it to be plausible. And I think there needs to be more of a recognition that espionage operations are team efforts and that there will be other significant agents involved. And even going back to The Living Daylights, when we've seen more of them than most other movies, you don't see a lot of other double O's in Bond. And whilst you want to focus on Bond as our main man, our protagonist and our sort of doorway into that universe, it would be very interesting to see, I think, other double O's in a team context in a Bond movie. We may be about to get that, I hope so. Do you each have a favorite Bond female character? Uh, I certainly do, um, by a country mile, and that's uh, Domino Vitali from Thunderball. Will you excuse me? You're not going to soon. I'm afraid so. My guardian's yacht. Oh, really? He'll be expecting me. May I come with you? I'd love to meet your guardian. Oh, no. Will I see you again? It's a small island. Perhaps we can have dinner together. No. My dear, uncooperative Domino. How do you know that? How do you know my friends call me Domino? It's on the bracelet on your ankle. So, what sharp little eyes you've got. Wait till you get to my teeth. I think uh, Claudine Orga is uh, one of the most attractive females to walk the face of the earth, and the, and the character is very fiery um, and, and is a no-nonsense character. So um, I think, you know, purely as a pretty female of the species she's lovely to look at but the character is interesting and um you know is not prepared to take any nonsense yeah this is one i struggle with i think because you know i think each bond defines his own female antagonists or female love interests and so there's interesting things with each of them you know i mean i i'm probably far more in the Pierce Brosnan era, because I think that's another interesting thing is that as you grow up, you have your own bond, right? And I'm sure we'll talk about that. But so for me, I'd probably say like, you know, I mentioned Michelle Yao and, and Halle Berry. I kind of like, enjoyed them as my favorites, I suppose. Jinx, you say? Born on Friday the 13th. You believe in bad luck? Let's just say my relationships don't seem to last. Mm. I know the feeling. The predators usually appear at sunset. And why is that? It's when their prey comes out to drink. So what do predators do when the sun goes down? They feast like there's no tomorrow. Yeah, I would have to go hands down with Pussy Galore and Honor Blackman. Well, how about it, handsome? Don't you think it's time we got to know each other socially? Well, the new Miss Galore. Where do you hide your gold knuckles in this outfit? Oh, I uh, never carry weapons after business hours. Yeah? So you're off duty? I'm completely defenseless. So am I. With a close second to Diana Rigg. You're full of surprises, Contessa. So are you, Mr. Bond. Do you always arm yourself for rendezvous? Occasionally, I seem to be excellent, Bron. I'll take that if you don't mind. You're very sure of yourself, aren't you? Suppose I were to kill you for a thrill. And those are the ones I grew up with, so I think those are the ones that kind of had the biggest impact on me. How do you think... These films have packaged Bond so that viewers can kind of live vicariously through him or feel connected to him in some way. But uh, do you feel that there's this vicarious connection to Bond that people have? Definitely. I mean, I 
you know, it flashes me back to being a, you know, 10-year-old running around my backyard with my friends pretending we're spies and secret agents. Get your 007 secret agent pen and disappearing vapor paper separately or packaged with a 007 secret agent ring and ID bracelet. Who doesn't want to do that, right? In the abstract, at least, and especially when put on screen in a James Bond film. I'd love to look as good as uh, any of the James Bonds look in a tuxedo. That's never going to happen, right? And it's, so there's that, you know, idea that you can, at a moment's notice, end up anywhere in the world fighting uh, the most villainous person out there and coming out on top. is It's, it's wonderful idea and something that probably very few of us will be able to do right pay attention bond this is the sinclair zx spectrum plus two it's a fully operational computer with 128k memory but it comes with three james bond games and a light gun that fires armor piercing shells now that's your assignment no no don't sit in that chair sorry bond haven't perfected that yet the sinclair zx spectrum plus two I don't have a, much of a different perspective to add. I mean, so, yes, yeah, certainly we all wanted to live vicariously. I mean, as um, as a small boy, when every new movie came out, the first thing you'd look for was, uh, you know, what new die-cast cars would be created that we could recreate car chases and invent our own Bond scenarios. Time for a spin in the new sports car, and behind me, scum sharks. I activated the blast shield and returned fire. Another fish to fry. Happy landings. James Bond Jr. When the video games came along, the same thing was uh, was possible, especially through the legendary GoldenEye game. GoldenEye, load a rumble pack and see how it feels when 007 meets M64. That being said, of course, Bond is not an aspirational character, as Fleming said many, many times. He's far more aspirational, I think, in the movies than in the books. Although, by the same token, you know, in Daniel's era, he got such a regular beating. <laughs> Funny man, Mr. Bond. Ah! Yeah! Ah! Ah! Mm! Yes! Yes! You could see the physical and emotional scars on the character, so I think perhaps less so, but he did serve to humanise the character and, and, and make him more accessible, if perhaps a little less vicarious. Okay, I need to take one more quick break, and then I'll be back to finish this discussion on Bond, James Bond. And to take us into the break, here's Eric Leonardis with a cold turkey. Hi, I'm Eric Leonardis. I'm a neuroscientist and an AI specialist, and this is what needs to stop cold turkey. All right, artificial intelligence is very popular in films these days. And the thing is, they're always hyper-intelligent, more intelligent than human beings. The fact is, after working in AI for a few years, you'll find that AI is actually very stupid. It doesn't do what you want. It doesn't actually, it's not actually capable of being a super intelligent human, okay? In movies like The Matrix, The Terminator, 2001 A Space Odyssey, Transcendence, what they forgot is that AIs are just gonna take human biases and run with them. They're gonna take the worst parts of you and they're gonna amplify them, okay? They're not gonna be, oh, so much smarter than humans, we're gonna exterminate the human race. No, I mean, they're gonna do it because a corporation paid them to do it, not because they're some super intelligent freak. Thanks, Eric, I appreciate your passion. Hold tight and I'll be right back with Gary and Jeff to pick our favorite bonds. Get the latest news right now on NPR One. The NPR One app lets you pick the local or national stories you like and hear only what you want, when you want. You can also listen live or discover new content like podcasts. Find NPR One in your app store. Welcome back. In the official Ian Productions canon of James Bond movies, there have been six actors to play the 007 role. So let's look at what each actor brought to the role and how they defined the character. I mean, Connery and Till Daniel brought, certainly brought a level of um, plausibility to the character. I hesitate to say realism. Of course, Spectre. And it wasn't a Russian show at all. 
You've been playing us off against each other, haven't you? But there was that there was that toughness which in most of Roger's tenure is missing. We see some of it in Live and Let Die, I think, because he was still trying to find his feet. My name's Bond. James Bond. I know who you are, what you are, and why you have come. You have made a mistake. You will not succeed. Rather a sweeping statement, considering we've never met. By and large, you know, Roger's trademark was the, was the quip. You're not a sportsman, Mr. Bond. Why did you break off the encounter with my pet python? I discovered he had a crush on me. If not actually breaking the fourth wall, then um, a, a certain level of knowing look to the camera, shall we say. When one is in Egypt, one should delve deeply into its treasures. And of course, George infamously with his... Uh, this never happened to the other fellow. ...was <laughs> somewhat treading the line between the two. I'm a, I'm a big fan, actually, of Brosnan. I think Brosnan's unfairly maligned because I think... He was the first uh, actor to kind of look at the oeuvre of what had gone before and um, produce a persona that was emerging of the of the sort of Mooresque knowing nod to the camera and and the grittiness of Connery. And I, I think to some extent he's maligned because of the disaster of Die Another Day. Was it painful? The gene therapy? You couldn't possibly imagine. Oh, good. I'm glad to hear that. Oh, but there have been compensations. Like watching you flail around in your ignorance, granting you life day by day just to see if you get wise. It's been fun. Well, the fun is about to come to a dead end. We only met briefly, you and I. But you left a lasting impression. You see, when your intervention forced me to present the world with a new face, I chose to model the disgusting Gustav Graves on you. Oh, just in the details. That unjustifiable swagger. Your crass quips. A defense mechanism concealing such inadequacy. My defense mechanism is right here. But, I, you know, I think, for, for one thing, every actor is a product of their time as well. They are a person of their time, and that inevitably bleeds into their portrayal. And then, of course, the what's going on in the world... Um, to what extent the script draws on that, you know, melds together. And we sort of carry forward this idea that, well, this is really one character, this is one person's life, and we, you know, sort of file away in the back of our head the fact that they look completely different and time has moved across nearly 60 years since that's happened. So it's a very interesting game, I think, one ends up playing with oneself whilst enjoying um, the Bond universe as a whole. Mr. Bond. Oh, yes. Mr. Bond. My name's Bond. James Bond. My name is Bond. James Bond. The name's Bond. James Bond. The name's Bond. James Bond. For me, the fascinating thing about Bond is that he's been around so long and been recast, and so every generation has the joy of finding their own kind of Bond and having that feel unique to them i think you know each each generation sees themselves reflected a little bit better in as as we kind of iterate through the decades and you get your favorite right you get to choose and i think that's part of the fun as well right you can it's not like some of these franchises where they are very static as far as the people that they have in there every every few years it changes out and you can have those arguments and i think that's part of what makes it fresh is that you know i can fight over whether i like um, timothy dalton or pierce brosnan or daniel craig who's the best one and you can have these arguments that have no stakes because it doesn't matter <laughs> but we can have that kind of discussion and have fun and and that's what i think has really kept those flames of fandom going for so long 007 seems to have the situation well in hand i just remember when they cast daniel craig oh my god the Oh, he's blonde. Oh, he's short. Oh, he's this. He looks, you know, it was like the amount of outrage that came out initially, I thought was really interesting. I knew it was too early to promote you. Well, I understand double O's have a very short life expectancy. So your mistake will be short lived. To me, Casino Royale was just a 
great reboot of the franchise that just reinvigorated my love for it. Any thug can kill. I want you to take your ego out of the equation and to judge the situation dispassionately. If Gary thinks Pierce Brosnan has been maligned, I think Timothy Dalton is probably one of my favorite actors in Bond, but I don't think he got the best movies. And I think that's a shame, because I think if he got one of the better scripts, he might have really had a great Bond film. But I really do enjoy him in the role, and I think I enjoy him more than Pierce Brosnan or Roger Moore, personally. Who are you? Bond, James Bond. Exercise Control 007 here. I'll report in an hour. Won't you join me? Better make that too. I would just say yes, I completely agree with you. And I think, honestly though, I think he had one good Bond movie and one really bad Bond movie. I think The Living Daylights was really good. Uh, this uh, plot stickle agent sounds rather far-fetched, sir. I know General Pushkin. Oh, do you think I don't? I've dealt with him on several occasions. Our paths have crossed over the years. He's tough and resourceful, but I can't believe he's a psychotic. Um, and License to Kill was really bad. I, I think that's too bad for him because it sounded like he just got caught in a bad moment where they weren't able to make that third one that he was planning on. And so I, that might have been where they could have course corrected a little bit. But I think the... The second one being not very good is what left a lot of people with a very bad taste in their mouth. Yeah, I agree fully. I think The Living Daylights is, is one of the standout movies, and I think his portrayal in, in that is probably closest to to the literary bond. And uh, as you say, Jeff, um, just as Brosnan suffered with Die Another Day, I think uh, the same thing happened there with, with Timothy's last outing too. Really, 007? Q, what the hell are you doing here? I might have killed you. Well, I'm on leave. Thought I'd pop round and see how you're getting on. You all right? Yes, of course I'm all right. How'd you find me? Well, money, Penny. Of course, she worried sick about you. This is no place for you, Q. Go home. Oh, don't be an idiot, 007. I know exactly what you're up to, and quite frankly, you're going to need my help. Remember, if it hadn't been for Q Branch, you'd have been dead long ago. I think it's you know, if we're going to talk about what makes a good bond, I think it's finding somebody who can balance the seriousness with the silliness and uh, you know every bond kind of like goes from one side to the other on that and some go too far and some go one way and some go too far the other way and so it's really figuring out where you can find the middle ground and and hitting that and i think because that i think that is really important you got to be able to have a little bit of fun with it because you're james bond it should be fun right <laughs> and i think you can of course go too far to the the serious side with that um and so you got to kind of find the middle lane there well in talking about the idea of change uh, albert broccoli is the one who you know started this franchise but he died in 1996 and one thing i'm a little curious about because she's kind of a private person. I don't see a whole lot of interviews with her, but Albert Broccoli's daughter, Barbara, was also one of the producers uh, on the film. She came on, I think, with the first Pierce Brosnan film. But do you think that she's exerted an influence on the way the franchise has gone? Because it seemed like when Daniel Craig came on board, that was kind of her first opportunity to cast that role without her father's kind of influence and shadow or, or you know the fact that her father was involved in, in picking Pierce Brosnan but do you think she's exerted some influence over where this franchise has gone? Uh, I think she definitely has personally and, and you know there's various um, accounts in the media of Daniel being um, a casting choice that she fought very hard for and as you say the uh, the outrage um, in the news media and online was uh, a ridiculous and be loud. I had recently seen Craig in Layer Cake, and so as soon as that was announced, I thought that's the guy for the job. Clearly, she, you know, she went to bat, and and it was absolutely the right choice, as you say. It rejuvenated the franchise and brought a level of success and interest that, that hasn't been seen since the 60s. As, a, as you know, I'm over here in London, and what you're seeing around London and around the country is a, is a level of Bond mania that uh, 
really echoes that time and I haven't seen this level of it um, for any of the other releases. Yeah, absolutely. I think she's uh, a key, if not the key driving force behind its continued success. Yeah, and I think she also plays a, a very strong role in kind of constraining Bond. I think what we've seen is, you know, a real focus on keeping it in the film universe. There's not you know, at least to now, been talk of some sort of TV spin-off or spinning off into another character of, you know, the Bond universe, like Money Penny, things like that. We haven't really seen that, and I think a lot of that comes down to really wanting to focus on this kind of crown jewel of James Bond and make the best James Bond versus trying to kind of diversify the brand, so to speak. But at the same time, I, I you know, I think from the very beginning. Bond has been commercialized in such a unique way to almost any other movie character out there. You know, I mean, you look at all of the merchandise and the uh, product placement that's out there. It's a very savvy business move that's continued on to now, I think, to keep that uh, character profitable and in, in pop culture. You know. Former SAS types with easy smiles and expensive watches. Rolex? Amiga. Beautiful. So where do you think the franchise is going to go after No Time to Die? This is, you know, Daniel Craig has said that this is going to be his last one. There's been a lot of talk about who's going to take over the 007 role, a lot of arguments online. What are your feelings for like what may happen next? I don't know if it will happen, but what I would like to see is uh, Lashana Lynch carry on as as a double O. Maybe, I think we kind of have to have Bond as 007, so there's gonna have to be some rejigging of the, the, double, o, the double O numbers, but um, you know, her character looks to be extremely interesting. You know, I think we're at long last after many, many, decades if not centuries getting better representation in our pop culture i want to see that continue i, I absolutely adore jeffrey wright as felix leiter but that might be because i adore jeffrey wright in pretty much any role but i think he's fantastic in that role it would be nice to see him continue i don't think that we will see a sort of more esque return i just don't think that's a style that's ever going to fly again um, as I mentioned earlier, I think Casino and Daniel's era in general is strongly influenced, if not a reaction to, the success of the Bourne franchise. You could sort of argue that Mission Impossible is filling the Moresque void, although it, it's a lot less knowingly tongue-in-cheek. It takes itself very seriously. It's just giving us this extreme end of the, of the fantasy spy genre. So... I think we'll carry on in the same vein. Um, I very, very much hope in my fanboy fantasy casting um, that we get Richard Madden as Bond, but um, I think he may have achieved a level of success that has pushed him out of that, and especially as he's probably got obligations to the Marvel Universe for a few films yet. I think this is going to be a very difficult turning point because I think we've seen Daniel Craig in this role for so long now that it's going to have... I would assume the producers are really thinking about where they want to go from here. What do they want to do? Because there's so many different options, right? Do they go with somebody really, really young that's going to give just a very dramatic, different take from, from what we've seen with Bonds? Most Bonds have been in their 40s, right? I mean, generally, when we see them in their prime, so do you go with somebody just fresh face uh, starting out? Or do you do something really radical, right? I mean, they could go back in time and set something back in the 60s. I don't think they will. I think they like keeping things in the modern era. But could you imagine that we get to go back and, and see a, a 60s era bond again? That would be pretty wild. And I, I think when it comes to who they cast, I think in my mind, it's always going to be somebody that you have a vague awareness of but don't really could never pick them out of a lineup or know their name because bond makes the actor you know the actor doesn't make bond and i think as long as they keep that in mind i think they'll probably be okay now we mentioned that bond is a fantasy spy and that he inspired a lot of imitators do you each have a favorite kind of 
spy film that's been inspired by Bond that's this fantasy Bond. I mean, for me, I think it's the In Like Flint films with James Coburn. Why would anyone want to kill Mr. Cramden? Or think the dog was meant for me. Seems I have a job whether I want one or not. But uh, do each of you have kind of your own non-Bond fantasy spy favorite? For me, more recently, I have to say it's the the Mission Impossible film series. I think it's that's taken all of the stunts that you expected out of a Bond film and cranked it to 11. I'm on the plane! Open the door! How did you get in the plane? Not in the plane! I'm on the plane! Open the door! You can't believe some of the stuff you see there. And it's definitely in that vein of the, the spy fantasy. But I also like how it has a team kind of base, which I think is an interesting shift from James Bond. Benji, open that door right now! Yeah, I'm trying! If I'm watching a James Bond film, while I do appreciate seeing some of those supporting characters, I don't want to watch a film of them doing stuff, which I think we've seen in some of the other movies, the Daniel Craig movies, where they've tried to give, like, M a subplot and Money Penny, and they're all kind of running around doing stuff. No, no, I don't need that. I need to see James Bond. I need to see him doing stuff. And they can go do that, you know, in the background, in, in the novelization of the, the movie. I don't need to see that here. I want to see James Bond. But in a Mission Impossible, yes, let's see the team. Let's see them doing all this kind of fun stuff around Tom Cruise. So I, those, that, those films are my kind of second runner-up to James Bond. You know, on that, on that point that you just mentioned there, I think the Mission Impossible films really took off when J.J. Abrams became involved. I mean, that... That third movie and and Philip Seymour Hoffman as the villain in that, I mean, he was absolutely terrifying. Um, in fact, at a level that you don't really see with uh, with Bond villains in terms of just the, the sheer psychopathy and uh, the fear that he engendered. And you're going to tell us everything. Every buyer you've worked with, every organization. What the hell is your name? Names, contacts, inventory lists. You have a, a wife, girlfriend... It's up to you how this goes. Because you know what I'm going to do next? I'm going to find her. Whoever she is, I'm going to find her and I'm going to hurt her. I love the Flint movies and I've, uh, like yourself, and I've been saying to anyone that will put up with me that it's high time we found somebody with the charisma of James Coburn and, uh, and redid those movies. They're just extraordinary and I think there's so much more life in that franchise. And I really, really enjoyed Guy Ritchie's uh, Man from Uncle redo. Um, although, and this is completely paradoxical for me, I felt that for an Uncle movie, it was too grounded. We recently discovered the existence of an international criminal organization with ties to former Nazis. Rumor has it that built an atom bomb. We have no choice but to work together to infiltrate this organization. We'll leave you two to get acquainted. I thought it was terrific and, uh, you know, I'm, I'm hoping there's, there's continual talk about revisiting it, but, um, you know, with Army Hammer's recent challenges, I don't know whether that's going to be possible, which would be a shame because I thought he was great in the, the Kuryakin role and having Kuryakin have uh, anger management issues was, was fun and very different. But if they do make it again, then I think that's a framework that really, really um, allows you to go to town and, and, and maybe sort of do the Austin Powers level, but dial it down by three notches and you'd have a really fun movie. And kind of to go out with, do you each have a favorite Bond and or Bond movie? I mean, I don't know if your favorite Bond and the favorite Bond movie line up together, but uh, what would you uh, leave us with as kind of your your choice of the best Bond? Uh-oh. Okay. Pressure's on pressure's on i'd say i really do like the living daylights i think that's probably of my bond the bond movies i rewatched it again recently and i really did enjoy that one um but favorite bond i think is a little different i think pierce brosnan overall i just he was the one that i was watching the most even though you know i grew up watching roger moore run up and down the uh golden gate bridge endlessly on the you know abc movie of the week or whatever i think pierce brosnan is my favorite bond by what means shall we execute you commander bond what no small talk no chit chat that's the trouble with the world today no one takes the time to do a really sinister interrogation anymore it's a lost art which i know is sacrilege to all those connery lovers so sorry shocking (laughs) 
Uh, for, for me, it's a very, very difficult question to answer because both depend to some extent on what kind of a mood I'm in and what sort of movie I want to watch. I have to say that I seldom watch a Roger movie and I kind of, when I watch any more Bond, I'm enjoying it because of the man we know Roger Moore to be rather than his portrayal of Bond as a character. You have a nasty habit of surviving. Well, you know what they say about the fittest? Uh, certainly Connery brings that, that level of uh, verisimilitude to the character. You look pale, Mr. Bond. I hope I didn't frighten you. No, you see, I've always been a nervous passenger. Some men just don't like to be driven. No, some men just don't like to be taken for a ride. And, and that's Daniel's great strength, I think, as, as, as well as his vulnerability. Um, if I absolutely have to pick one, um, <laughs> then I tend to always go with Skyfall. I, I, I just thought Skyfall was an extraordinary movie at an extraordinary moment in the franchise. Q, I need help. I'm tracking the car. Where are you going? I've got M. We're about to disappear. What? I need you to lay a trail of breadcrumbs, impossible to follow for anyone except Silver. Think you can do it? I'm guessing this isn't strictly official. Not even remotely. So much for my promising career in espionage. And it's a strange movie in one regard in that even though it plays a lot on backstory of, of all of the characters really, but particularly Bond and M, if you took out the Bond aspect of it, it would take very minimal script tuning to make that work as a standalone espionage slash thriller movie. And I think that's kind of a remarkable achievement to be all things to all people. And it, it just was this exceptionally brash film. And so, yeah, for me, Skyfall. Yeah, I agree. It's very hard for me to pick, but I think my favorite Bond movie is From Russia With Love. My favorite Bond is definitely Sean Connery with Daniel Craig being a second. And uh, Casino Royale is probably right up there with From Russia With Love. But I have to give props to Goldfinger as probably the most rewatchable Bond movie. If that is ever on or if ever anybody says, oh, let's watch a Bond movie, it's like, that's a pretty go-to one. You are a clever, resourceful man, Mr. Bond. Well, thank you. Perhaps too clever. Twice our paths have crossed. Let's leave it at that. I should think our first meeting would have convinced you. Oh, I see. You worried about me not giving you a return game. Both of us know perfectly well what we are talking about, Mr. Bond. That wraps up another edition of KPBS listener-supported Cinema Junkie. But it doesn't wrap up my discussion with Jeff and Gary, because they'll be back to discuss the more realistic spy world of John le Carré. And remember to check out Cinema Junkie Presents Geeky Gourmet, where I show you how to make food themed to each podcast. The videos are available on the KPBS YouTube channel. And the latest one shows you how to make food themed to the three locations featured in No Time to Die, Jamaica, Norway, and Matera, Italy. Not only that, but I'll show you how to make a cake with the famous gun barrel design of the 007 Open. And coming up, I'll speak with a mixologist about Bond cocktails. Dry martini. Oui, monsieur. Wait. Three measures of Gordon's, one of vodka, half a measure of quinoa lily. Shake it over rice and then add a thin slice of lemon peel. I'd like to acknowledge the talented team that makes Cinema Junkie happen. Podcast coordinator, Kinsey Moreland. Technical director, Rebecca Chacon. And director of sound design, Emily Jankowski. Till our next film fix, I'm Beth Accomando, your resident Cinema Junkie. Now pay attention, 007. I've always tried to teach you two things. First... Never let them see you bleed. And the second? Always have an escape plan.